Hello, everyone, and welcome to HIV.gov's coverage of the 2024 Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections. My name is Louis Shackleford, he, him pronouns. I am the Director of External Relations at the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, and I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Carl Diefenbach. Dr. Diefenbach is the Director of the Division of AIDS. Dr. Yeah. Diefenbach, it's great to be with you. It great is to talk to you. It's really today. great to be back at a meeting with you. We haven't seen each other in this forum since um, IAS um, last summer. So I know. It's I know. great to be back. I know. And we had a great conversation at IAS, so I'm looking forward to talking with you more. So just to get started today, we've heard a lot of news about DoxyPep. And we had a lot of great presentations, a lot of new information. But before we launch into that, I just wanted to see if you can give our audience a brief overview of what is DoxyPep and why is it important? So let's go over what doxypep, let's take the words apart. Doxy refers to doxycycline, which is a, a drug that's used to treat bacterial infections. PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So what we have is, um, has been, it actually was reported first at the IAS meeting a year ago, Last year. Um, where the use of dose of, do, of doxycycline taken between 20, as soon as possible, up to maybe 72 hours after an unprotected sex act it will protect you then from developing a bacterial STI. That's a sexually transmitted infection focused primarily on chlamydia, syphilis, mm -hmm. and gonorrhea. Those mm -hmm. are the big three. And so that's been the, the thrust of what has been discussed for the last year and the work we've heard coming out of the meeting is how the stability and the power of um, of this technology has been able to really help men who have sex with men and trans transgender women um, avoid um, STIs. And for those who may not know, doxycycline, is that a new medication? Is that something that's been around for a while? That's a really important question. It is as old as the hills. <laughs> no, in all, in all honesty, um, one of the other uses is for treating cystic acne, for example. Mm. Um, and it is actually a drug that is used quite commonly. And so this is where I think having a simple, relatively easy to acquire and use um, medication is a really good thing. One of the seeming like the only sort of holdback is you should probably only take it once a day. Mm. But that's not, you know, that's not that big a deal. So, but it is tied to sex and it is th this time period immediately um, within this reasonable uh, use the, the medication at that time. That's awesome. We definitely need more tools so that people can go out and have the pleasure that they, right. that they deserve yeah. and that they enjoy. Yes. So with that, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about HIV, specifically HIV vaccines. That's another thing that we're looking for new tools to prevent. And so vaccines are a great way to prevent disease we know overall. And so I just wanted to get a sense from you. We, get, we hear a lot about phase one trials. I've heard a lot about phase one vaccine trials at this meeting. Can you talk a little bit about what is the significance of a phase one trial? What is a phase one trial? What's the significance of it? And how does it help us get interventions like an HIV vaccine? It's a really important question because phase one is often the first in human where the, you have the, the vaccine concept, you vaccinate people and you look to see if it's, there's a safety signal or, and then also what the immunogenicity or what the response is in the human body. Often we've seen how the vaccine works in, say, non-human primates or in mice, but this is our first opportunity to dig in and see how this behaves in people. And what's a non-human primate? A non-human primate is a monkey. Okay. It is a putting, it's the closest thing we have to a way of determining how these um, vaccines would work in a primate before we, want it, before we put them um, into uh, the human species. And in phase one trials, we're looking at what specifically? 
we're looking specifically at the immune response against that vaccine in those people that are, are vaccinated and then are able to determine if there's any sort of side effects that come out. <clears throat> and But then we can also see exactly how the vaccine behaves as an immunogen, meaning how does it change the chemistry of the antibodies and T cells that are in the body that are the, the disease fighting components that a vaccine tries to induce to awesome. make it so um, protected. Awesome. Well, thank you for that information. So as you know, the HBTN, we conduct a lot of phase one trials, but there are also many other groups across the country, across the world, conducting phase one vaccine trials. I wanted to know from your purview, what are you excited about in the phase one portfolio of vaccine trials that we have going now? So uh, let's talk about phase one as a way of validating a concept. So this idea that we can figure out how to start with an immunogen and trigger the human body to make broad neutralizing antibodies um, is a really powerful concept. And so I'm very excited about that kind of research. But I think the bigger picture of that is, is as we do more and more of these studies, can develop the prediction capacity to say, this immunogen will in fact do exactly what we think it will do. So the type of work that's going on is going to allow us to build a model so that we can design these vaccines faster and with a little bit more accuracy. So that's what I think is really exciting about the, uh, the phase one program. Julie McElrath today said in her plenary, there are 14 ongoing or planned phase ones. And that's just the, the ones that we're involved with. Uh, there, uh, other groups have other studies going on. But the good thing is with phase ones, they're small enough and the data will be so accessible that we can all learn from each other. And this is where the community of researchers comes together uh, to build a, bit, a better vaccine. Awesome, awesome. And last point before we leave, you mentioned broadly neutralizing antibodies. So for those who may not know, can you give a little overview of what is a broadly sure. neutralizing antibody? Uh, broad, so we have this issue in HIV is that we have this beautifully dangerous molecule that sits on the surface of the virus called the HIV envelope. And that is the machine that the virus uses to bind to the surface of a cell and go into the cell and make progeny virus. It's the entry machinery. So what we need to do, and what antibodies do for any virus, is coat that machinery and prevent it from getting to the surface of the cell. So. Uh, because we're talking about HIV, there are only five regions of that envelope where we can really focus and think we can get good antibodies or broad neutralizing antibodies, because that's the conserved parts where people around the world have isolated antibodies that then will neutralize, inactivate a large number of the circulating strains of HIV. So the broad neutralizing refers to how much of the global expanse of sequence of variation, variability that exists in HIV can come together um, and be then uh, inhibited, whatever word you like to use, blocked, blocked, blocked's <laughs> a great word, um, you know, by the monoclonal antibodies. Awesome. Kudos to you for explaining antibodies in like less than a minute, a minute and a half. Thank you. Can we come back a moment just to the whole doxy prep story? Sure. Because I really think it's important that we take this moment in time where it's been a year since the, or about nine months since the finding came out. And at this meeting, what we saw was work at the, at the science level in terms of ongoing work on the clinical trial that really was dynamite and validated everything we've seen in the clinical trials. We've seen it then move to the community level where um, individual uh, organizations have gone and implemented at, in community and it, 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 one clinic in San Francisco had over 3,000 people come in and uptake um, doxypep, which is really important for that population of MSM and transgendered individuals in San Francisco. 
And then also at the city level, San Francisco has done an investigation of the, of the penetration and the impact of doxypep uh, at the level of STIs across the city. And so this movement from the individuals in a trial to the clinic to the citywide um, is a really important step in such a fast period of time. It would be great to see other jurisdictions also moving quickly to implement um, doxypep. Um, apparently, my dear friend, um, the Admiral uh, from CDC, John O'Merman, is going to give us a presentation on, uh, later in the week for this group. And I think it's really important to hear how he is promulgating uh, a strategy and guidelines that we can all really get behind for, uh, for DoxyPEP. So we're looking forward to what the CDC has to say. So there's a free announcement for my colleagues at CDC, <laughs> uh, but it'll be great to, to have that be a, a, just a landmark event that occurs out of this meeting. That's really awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. It's always a pleasure seeing you and talking with you. I gain so much from these interactions. So looking forward to talking with you some more. Yes. And seeing you again sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And thank you to our audience. Thank you for joining us today. Please continue to look out for more coverage of CLOI 2024 on HIV.gov. That's HIV.gov's blog and on the social media channels. Take care. Have a great one.